Welcome to our weekly edition of Deep Dive featuring Hudson Institute. I'm Jonathan Hassan, and in today's edition, we'll once again focus on Middle Eastern intricacies, but this time with chief focus on Iran's nuclear aspirations. What is the state of play? What are the concerns at hand? To uh, discuss all that, we will now turn to my colleague in Washington, D.C., Mr. Jonathan Schechtel, formerly a senior foreign policy or the senior foreign policy advisor to the Prime Minister of Israel, uh, Mr. Benjamin Netanyahu, uh, currently a senior fellow at Hudson Institute. It's good to see you, Jonathan. Uh, I'd like to start with asking you to give us a little bit of a broad specter of the current state of play and then draw from that into what are things right now that we should focus on with regard to Iran's nuclear program. Uh, good day and thank you uh, for having me today. It's good to see you. I think, uh, you know, if we look uh, first, let's look at the context of uh, the war, the ongoing war. I think what we said very early on from the very first days after October 7th uh, still holds true, which is it's it's very easy to look at this as a war between uh, Israel and Hamas in Gaza. But of course, it's really just one front in a much broader war uh, where you have on the one side, you have the United States, you have Israel and their partners and allies in the region. And on the other side, you have uh, Iran and its uh, terror proxies uh, across the region as well. And you see manifestations of this um, you know, every day and every week. Just in the past week, we've, uh, we've seen the, uh, the back and forth uh, with the Houthis in Yemen. Of course, there continues to be exchanges of fire on the northern, uh, Israel's northern border with Hezbollah. The fighting is going on uh, in Gaza and the list, uh, the list goes on. I think all of this is taking place um, and in the meantime, the centrifuges in Iran continue to spin. And, uh, you know, we get these periodic reports of uh, increases in Iran's stockpile of enriched uranium, uh, increases or planned increases in uh, or expansion uh, and enhancement of its nuclear infrastructure. And just last week at the uh, Aspen Security Conference, we heard uh, Secretary of State Blinken uh, again, reiterate the U.S. assessment that uh, uh, Iran is is just a week or two uh, from having enough uh, material uh, for um, enriched uh, uranium for a nuclear weapon. Um, but he also said, and I think this is one of the big problems with the approach to the nuclear program. He also said that you know, as of right now, the U.S. doesn't see. Uh, that Iran is moving toward the actual production of uh, of a weapon, and uh, I think that this this has all of the makings of uh, what in, in in Israel is known as a conceptia, uh, you know, a concept um, where you have um, assumptions about uh, security and intelligence matters, uh, which might be true but might be false. And when you look at all of the other things that are going on uh, with Iran's nuclear program, and I'm sure that um, that Ali will be able to speak to this uh, in more detail than I am than I can, um, uh, you you have to wonder if sort of uh, holding out hope that they're not doing some things uh, is is more uh, wishful thinking than uh, than anything else. Unfortunately, so uh, with that, we will return to the remarks made by uh, Secretary of State Antony Blinken. But first, uh, Dr. Oli Heinonen, formerly uh, Deputy Director General of the International Atomic Energy Agency, currently a distinguished fellow at Stimson Center. It's good to see you, Oli. Uh, I'd like to refer to a couple of points made by the Director General, uh, currently Rafael Mariano Grossi of the IAEA, who uh, published in an essay to uh, Foreign Affairs the following. He said that Iran has enriched a significant amount of uh, uranium to military grade for which there is no logical peaceful use. He continued by saying that in Iran, the IAEA has found traces of undeclared man-made uranium and Tehran has not been forthcoming in answering many of the agency's questions. As a result, the agency cannot assure that all of the activities in Iran's growing nuclear program are entirely peaceful. And then he also emphasizes that there is no longer a far-reaching long-term system of enhanced 
monitoring and verification to reduce the risk of proliferation around Iran's civil nuclear program. Uh, as things stand, Iran is the only non-nuclear weapon state producing uranium at 60 percent enrichment. Uh, what are your thoughts uh, right now when you hear those remarks? And to what degree can we uh, expect to really know the scope of which Iran has managed to accumulate the, the weapons-grade material? And beyond that, uh, is the, the intelligence community in the West really in a status of knowing uh, the, the depth of which the Islamic Republic has managed to accumulate. Thank you for having me. I think that these are serious warnings which, which Mr. Grossi brings now into the public, and it's a high time to take a look at, look at this in more detail and to see what can be done in current circumstances by the international community to find out that is Iran really honoring its NPT applications fully, or is it, like it looks to me increasingly, it's hedging for nuclear weapons capability. We knew this from the very beginning when the AMAD project came to the, AMAD plan came to the end, that they will continue certain activities, which were also mentioned by Secretary Blinken a couple of days ago, that they continue most likely modeling of the nuclear weapon, they continue high explosive studies. We have seen publications of these people. People went to the universities. They have been wor working with the foreign entities. They have been working with people who have the same capabilities. So the only way to find it out is that Iran is now finally forthcoming, explains those traces of uranium, shows the IAEA, the equipment, and let the international community to verify that all those capabilities of the AMAD plan had been dismantled or they are dormant and they are not used for any, for any clandestine purpose. Unless we can solve this part of the equation, Iran can, continues to use the enriched uranium stocks and the statements about possible change in the nuclear doctrine as a hedging device, putting pressures more and more to the other counterparts when the negotiations will start again, perhaps early next year. So this is a crucial point, and it's time to stay calm and try to pursue Iran not to pass the red line. Here, the red line is just a thin line drawn in sand. When you go from nuclear threshold capacity to actual nuclear weapons manufacturing, that is a fine line. And it may be too late for the intelligence to find out when it has taken place, as we see, for, for example, from North Korea. Well, uh, I hope that the confidence projected by the intelligence communities does not encourage complacency in understanding that there are many unknowns in this reality. But let's now turn uh, to elsewhere here in Israel, where we're joined by uh, Brigadier General in Reserve, Yaron Ozen, formerly an Israeli Air Force commander, a fighter pilot, and the IDF chief of cyber staff. It's good to see you, General. Good I'd to like to government. return to, it's good to see you indeed, I'd like to return to the remarks made by, or the reference made by Jonathan uh, uh, Shechtel with regard to remarks made by Antony Blinken at the Aspen Security Conference uh, during the course of which he uh, pretty much warned uh, that Iran now has the ability to produce enough uh, weapon-grade feasible material to create a nuclear weapon in less than a month. Uh, as well as that, uh, within the various quotes, uh, irrespective of that fact, he he highlighted that the first thing that we need to do, uh, reference uh, to the United States, of course, is to see if uh, the Iranians are serious about engaging and actually pulling back on uh, the work that is done on its program. Uh, what else do the Iranians need to do to convince this current administration in Washington and the team uh, under it that the Iranians are not genuine in their activities with when it comes to its nuclear aspirations? Actually, not much, because it seems like their plan is going very well, moving forward very well. And I think the international community led by the United States, there's no other 
relevant global power that can lead such an effort uh, amongst the you know democratic uh, countries uh, globally. Iran wants to be you know a meaningful regional power and it wants to be nuclear uh, because it thinks there's a it believes that there's a connection. And they are uh, in the midst of a very long-term um, strategy that's actually working very well for them. First of all, it is th th there are sort of you know basic new normals that uh, Iran has uh, created um, uh, a new strategic framework, uh, if you will, with how Iran you know deals with the region and deals with the world vis-a-vis -vis the negotiations, uh, NPT or, uh, or anything else. First of all, regionally, um, it is accepted that Iran can project power um, with proxies and directly towards the region. Uh, the region is accepting it and the allies are not doing enough uh, to deem that as unacceptable. Uh, they have created a new normal that terror is a tool of war. Uh, it's actually legitimate to use that um, in, in the various regions that they're working uh, uh, around, um, you know, the various countries they are uh, involved in. Uh, Israel's existence is not legitimate. They've created this, this uh, wave of uh, uh, non-legitimacy for, for Israel. And, uh, uh, you know, if you look specifically to Israel, projecting power into a sovereign state uh, through missiles directly, indirectly through proxies, it's, it's fine. Israel has defense and it's okay. We have an umbrella. It's raining a little bit. Israel, what are you complaining? Let's just shoot at them and it's fine. This is, uh, and of course, there there's more than that i mean on the on the social networks and all the diplomatically diplomatic harassments that they are very successfully leading around the world in all the international uh, bodies this is something that I, I don't see how the other side iran uh, iran how they even start thinking that the world is serious with them you know game theory is very is very simple i heard once uh uh, uh, Professor Uman, uh, after he won the, the, the Nobel uh, Peace Prize. And he said something very simple. He said, I don't know why they gave me the Nobel Prize. I said something very simple. If you want to convince someone that you are serious, you need to really believe in what you're doing. And the other side needs to believe that you believe. That's game theory. That's the whole thing. And from what the international community is doing, it doesn't seem like the international community is really believing that we can stop Iran and they see that and that's what's going on here and I think it everything starts from that. Mr. Schechter, I see you shaking your head in acquiescence. Uh, does Jerusalem believe that it can stop Iran's nuclear program and within that context does Washington believe that it has the capacity to do so as well? I, I don't know what uh, what people believe in Jerusalem or in Washington. I know what they say. Uh, in Jerusalem, the policy has been consistent for a long time. The Israeli policy has been that Israel will not allow Iran uh, to uh, to get nuclear weapons. You know whether or not they believe that is uh, is another question. Uh, in the United States, I think there is clearly the capacity, but there's a question about uh, intent and will. And what you've seen from, I think, the earliest days uh, of, uh, of the Biden administration uh, is a, uh, you know, there was initially there was a desire to return to the JCPOA. Um, and as part of that, you had um, a, a strong commitment to de-escalation. And so even when there would be confrontation, spokespeople for the administration would say, you know, we chose the, even when, you know, when they use force, they said, you know, we chose the option uh, that was, you know, th the most de-escalatory. And I think that when you have a negotiation and you've got one side that is um, committed to de-escalation, but another side that is perfectly willing to escalate, I think that the, the, uh, the outcome is, uh, is a foregone conclusion. I think also right now in Washington, 
Um, there are a lot of other things going on that are capturing uh, attention. Internationally, domestically, you have the election. You've got uh, uh, President Biden just announced that he's not going to run. There are a million other things going on besides the uh, Iran uh, nuclear program from Washington's perspective. Um, and so there's, you know, there's a question of, uh, of time and attention and, and effort that's going to be invested in this. I would just also flag, this is a crucial year and a little more right now, because uh, in 2025, uh, unless uh, one of the European partners in the JCPOA activates the JCPOA snapback mechanism that's anchored in, in UN Security Council Resolution 2231, then that mechanism itself will expire. Uh, what that means in practice is that the diplomatic tools that are available to put pressure on Iran will go away because at that point, all of the previous Security Council resolutions expire as well. And the likelihood of any sort of punitive or, or pressure mechanism passing the Security Council in the current environment where you have the war in Ukraine and you've got the alliance between uh, Iran and Russia and Iran and China, getting through the Security Council is basically zero. And I think this also to, uh, to all these points from before, even if you put the JCPO, JCPOA aside and you just look at Iran's non-compliance with the NPT and there have been you know, numerous uh, discussions and resolutions in the IAEA Board of Governors about this, but, but I think there's a reluctance to refer to the Security Council because what that will do is it will show actually not the, uh, the power of the Security Council, but the, the ineffectiveness of the Security Council to actually exact uh, a price from Iran. Dr. Heinonen, we actually spoke about the snapback just before the panel today, and uh, uh, we discussed whether or not uh, October 25 uh, will include a, such a snapback. Uh, I'd like to ask you within this context, do you expect the E3, namely Brit uh, Britain, Germany, and France to follow through on such a, a dramatic move, a necessary move in my opinion, but of course not everybody thinks that way, uh, in the event that the United States would demand uh, the uh, Europeans to follow through? Well, well, if I start, I think that the snapback is good if it is enforced. But, but if it is not enforced, it's a useless exercise. So one has to do a lot of heavy lifting before triggering a snapback to make sure that those sanctions are fully implemented. Otherwise, no real result. Well, uh, within that context, if I may have a, a follow up, how do you see regional actors currently looking at the Iranian progress on its nuclear proliferation, uh, countries such as Turkey, which is historically a rival to the Islamic Republic, Egypt for that matter, Saudi Arabia and others, are they deeply concerned of the latest developments or have they grown somewhat complacent in light of the uh, uh, complacency, which uh, is projected out of Washington with regard to the nuclear file? Well, if it is for me to answer, it would be difficult. And I think that really what is now needed is a strategic decision, not a tactic decision how we deal, let's say, increasing enlistment capability of Iran. But look, what is the real end game? Like when people were thinking in 2003, what we really want to do, what kind of Middle East we have, what kind of nuclear programs will be there, and then go for the, from there to a solution and take into interests of Iran, but keeping one thing in mind, this is not only about uranium enrichment, this is also dismantlement of the other capabilities which are related to nuclear weapon development. If those remains there, few months later, small dispute, and we are back where we did start. So it's a change in the thinking, change in the approach which is needed. And this is up to the major players like um, uh, US, China also, I think it's important to get joined to this, and then the European countries. 
that's the way to go, but it needs heavy lifting and a person who has integrity to put this together. Thank you, Dr. Heinonen. General Rosen, I'd like to ask you particularly about what Mr. Schechter referred to, and that is the strike on the port of Al-Hudeda, which is controlled by the Houthis in Yemen. Can we uh, see this as a signal to the Islamic Republic? Of course, the ramifications of this uh, domestically in Yemen are vast, but with regard to Iran, is it deterred from this latest Israeli action? Yeah, I, I think the um, the last uh, attack on, on Al Hudeda, the the port, um, is is definitely something that sends a very clear message to to the region. In in many ways, actually, it's it's a very interesting uh, uh, move on on behalf of Israel. I, I I wish it would be it would be done much earlier because of what I said previously. The fact that Israel accepted uh, rain of missiles and drones and whatnot from uh, an uh, Iranian proxy for nine months is is just something that hurts the stability of the region because it projects weakness from uh, Israel and Israel's strength uh, uh, projects uh, the power projection from the Israeli side sort of calms down all these you know, uh, proxies and how they act. And when Israel and the United States and allies are weak, all these, you know, um, um, militias and, and whatnot, they all they all rise and, and start uh, playing around in this area. And, and what we see is maybe uh, an example of how resolve looks like. Because the Straits of Babel Manda, are a global uh, maritime uh, route uh, housing. I think the, the numbers are between 10 to 20% of global commerce, namely from the East to, to Europe and, and the West, but not only. And, and, and the meaning of this to regional play, uh, you know, region, uh, countries in the region, such as Egypt, that gets about half a million dollar per ship crossing through the Suez Canal, it's just a, a strategic blow from Iran to Egypt and also to Saudi Arabia, which has ports on its west side, not only on its east side. And the, the Houthis that send missiles to Israel uh, project power on the Babel Mandab, uh, the Straits of Babel Mandab, project power and shoot missiles on the UAE and the Saudi ports in the uh, uh, Persian Gulf. Uh, all these things when they are accepted by the international community, they send a message. And now, after the attack on the uh, El Hudeda, the port of El Hudeda, this changes a little bit the dynamics. First of all, it puts them on the defensive side for a change, God forbid, and this is how we need to deal with such terror militaries or militias that pose threats regionally, that's the first thing. And the second thing, uh, the, it, it is clearly Iran, because Iran, the, the port was attacked for a reason, because the main oxygen uh, lifeline of the Houthis is the port. That's where you they get their um, munitions and capabilities from Iran. So it really shows the head of the snake, or the octopus, if you will, and it shows the tentacle that... There's a red line, and I think it's time, again, to rebuild uh, stability in the, in the language of the Middle East. Sadly, I'm saying this, but this is it. And now this goes back to Iran and the discussion on the nuclear deal and the future of the nuclear deal. I don't think that a good long-term nuclear deal will be achieved from a position of weakness. It just does not happen in negotiations. The international community, Israel cannot do this alone. If if Jerusalem believes that there's a red line and Israel will attack, that's good. But, you know, between here and Iran, there are uh, a thousand miles to that are much more complicated than going to the port of El Hudeda. And I, I say this humbly, it won't be Absolutely. a walk in the park. I think the strike on the port of Al Hudeda has indicated the vulnerability of the Houthis, 
which is a very important signal to the tribes that have uh, interwoven their future with this uh, Shiite militia, despite being Sunnah in most cases, and that, of course, diminishes the capacity of uh, uh, this uh, Shia tribe to project its capacity to strike wherever it wants without, uh, of course, deliberate responses, since we have to accept uh, the fact that uh, Task Force 153, so-called Prosperity uh, Guardian, uh, Operation Prosperity Guardian, has failed. Uh, in one sentence from each of you, no longer than that because we don't have time, what should we expect for the next week ahead, ahead of our next deep dive uh, production? Jonathan, we'll start with you. Well, I think the uh, uh, the main thing uh, that's uh, on the radar right now, of course, is Prime Minister Netanyahu's uh, visit to Washington, uh, where he, uh, as of this morning, is uh, is supposed to meet later this week with uh, with President Biden. He's supposed to give his speech um, uh, before a joint session of uh, uh, of Congress. Um, uh, I think he may also meet with uh, with Vice President Harris. Uh, and we'll see what kind of uh, messages come out of Washington um, together when you have the leaders together uh, to go along with uh, the messages that uh, that hopefully were sent by uh, by uh, um, what uh, what General Rosen uh, described uh, in uh, in Yemen last week. Indeed, Dr. Heinonen. This is not the time to sit and watch what's happening. It's a time to create a coalition which can have a resolve and bring this uh, development to the end. Nothing less is needed. General Rosen? One is Israel will need to end, um, end uh, its current stage in Gaza. And the second, it will need to help with the United States lead with the change of atmosphere due to the stepping down of, of uh, President Biden um, for re-election, I think it will need to work very hard, whether whatever uh, administration is going to come in, uh, it will need to lead the resolve of the international community in the Middle East. General Rosen, Dr. Heinonen, and Mr. Shechtel, thank you so very much for your insights. I'd like to thank all of you at home as well. Until our next edition of Deep Dive featuring Hudson Institute, have a good day. <laughs>